Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Ball here, your favorite gun channel in beautiful bright Hanglish language and today I have a very special carbine in my hands, it's from the French Wars, it's a French light cavalry carbine. Its original name is Mousqueton de Cavalerie Légère or the Hussard, model 1786, system 1777. Ha! I apologize to my French speaking friends, it won't happen again. But it took me at least 10 records to do it properly. Probably not 100% properly, but something that probably sounded like French. So thanks and sorry. Today we usually call it a carbine, but according to the French terminology, the carbine was a rifled arm. So we rather call it a mousqueton. And this is what I'm going to try to do all along the series of these videos. I have to admit I have a crush on muzzle-loading cavalry firearms, and I have to say that the model 1786 light cavalry musketon is one of the most elegant ones. Making it work today on the range is a true privilege. This is actually a three-part series. The first part is already online, it's about the cartridges of the model 1777 firearms family. The second part, where we are now, is dealing about how these guns were manufactured, was a real deal of the 1777 firearms family. And the third part will be dealing with the history of this exact carbine, <laughs> Muscaton. But before we continue, let me thank you for your support. You make this channel rolling, which I'm very grateful for. So if you think there is value in what I do, then please support us through patreon.com slash capandball. That's a really good help for us. Here you can find exclusive content also from me. We are also present on the History of Weapons and War platform, which is a perfect place for all the gun nuts like us. It is ad-free and it is uh, providing many thousands of uh, videos about firearms related content, all coming from the best educational channels on YouTube. Please like, comment, share, switch on notifications to help the channel grow. The model 1777 firearms family was not developed in one day. In fact, the reform process started at the beginning of the 18th century. In 1717, the first standardized musket of the French army, the Standing Army, was developed. And in the very early times, in 1722, there was a trial, there was a, let's say, an experiment to try to manufacture the locks of these guns from interchangeable parts. This was not really successful, so after a few years, after 8 or 10 years, this project was abandoned. So far, we do not know who exactly the leader of this project was, but it was an early attempt for interchangeable manufacturing. By that time, the 17.5mm caliber was considered a light caliber, a small caliber, because by that time, the European muskets had a caliber of 18 to 20 mm, which was much larger, it needed much more lead, much more powder. The French Empire, however, focused on the 17.5mm caliber, which in fact, at the end of the century, at the end of the 18th century, will be, let's say, a role model for nearly all the European armies. When designing the 1777 firearms family, cost, durability and quality were in focus, of course. But, in fact, it is not really interesting what these guns are. Probably they are the best moosebore arms of the age. Probably we can all agree on, on that. But it is much more interesting how they were manufactured, because this leads us to the question of interchangeable manufacturing, and that was called the new method of manufacturing at the end of the 18th century. The project took up in the second half of the 18th century and was empowered by the Enlightenment and it was executed by military officers who had an education in engineering. One of them was Jean-Baptiste Vaquet de Pripoval. He was the leader of the whole process and his first task was to modernize the artillery of the French army. His goal was to reach interchangeability of parts to ease military logistics and to reduce the costs and speed up manufacturing processes. He also tried to reduce the number of pieces that were in service in the French army. The project started in 1763 and although it had some kind of success, all in all, it was not 100% successful. So there were political problems with introducing this system. First one, the supporters of the old system, the old artillery system of Jean Florent de Valier, they were still fighting against the new system of the Gribovalist officers. Second, the old system had to remain in service as well, which means that with the introduction of the Griboval uh, artillery pieces, which introduced new calibers, by the way, the number of artillery pieces and service increased, which did not ease the military logistics, in fact it made it much harder. Bonaparte and Napoleon was not in favor of the system as well. 
He did not like the idea of having a 4 and an 8 pounder cannon, while they could be entirely replaced with the 6 pounder guns. This was one of the reasons he supported the change back to the Valier system. Griboval, of course, was searching for a better artillery, more accurate, more destructive artillery, but he was also trying to change the logistics behind it, and this caused the clash between the old system and the new system. The old system was simple system. The army was in contract with trading companies who received the orders and the pattern arms approved by the king. These pattern arms were distributed to the contractors, the manufacturers, who delivered the trading company complete arms, copies of the pattern arms. The new system was different. The trading company's position was weakened and the army supported contracting the manufacturers directly, while the arsenals were risen to a higher level in the system. The government provided gauges, dies and templates to the manufacturers instead of sample arms, while the inspectors were sent to the important production facilities. The templates were used as guides for the hand workers. They were made of hardened steel, so the files don't damage them by working. The gauges were used for verification of the size of the parts. The private contractors delivered the parts to the state-owned arsenals, where they were inspected before assembly. Only the perfect parts were used in the production. The rejected ones were returned to the contractors. The arsenals therefore became key locations for manufacturing and inspection of parts and assembly. A few of these templates and gauges were always sent to the arsenal for future reference, so they could be replicated in case of wear. The ones you see in the picture, a gauge set for the 1777 musket, is visible in the Musée de l'Armée in Paris, a museum well worth a visit for gun nuts like us. When the modernization of the artillery seemed complete, Philippe Sharp Tonzon de Caudray, a key personality in the introduction of the Griboval system, suggested the king that it is time for the small arms. So in 1776, the king established the committee of Gribovalist officers to examine the possibility to modernize the guns and to decide on the new firearms family. This committee first specified the infantry musket. They said first that the barrel must be held by two bands. Second, the front barrel band must have a channel for the ramrod. Third, the stop must have a lunar shape cut out for accurate aiming. Fourth, the pen must be made of brass, it must be removable, and it must be tilted for easier loading. And fifth, the hammer must be strong and uh, durable with an opening under the jaws. Altogether, five prototypes were submitted for these trials, and Griboval established a three-man committee to decide which one is the best. And this committee was led by Griboval himself. The general had his own protégé. His name was Honoré Blanc. He was the superintendent of the Royal Armory in saint -Etienne, and he was a great supporter for interchangeability and for standardization. And guess what? He won. And this is the start of the atom that we call today interchangeable manufacturing of locks and muskets during the French wars. This period lasted up until 1801, until the death of uh, Honoré Blanc. The heart of the system was the lock. Reaching interchangeability here was the key element of the whole project. With Honoré Blanc's words, the pieces of which a lock is composed are manufactured separately, and after the establishment of the system, it will be possible to indiscriminately mix them together and afterwards to select at random pieces for making a lock, and therefore, anyone can repair a lock with the same ease as he would change the flint. He was not only planning to reduce the costs and speed up manufacturing, but also to reduce the necessity of skilled workers during the complete production process. He was to reach this by using templates, gauges, dies, and specialized tooling that he also designed for the whole process. The king was fully supportive with the project, so he appointed Blanc in 1778 the superintendent of three royal armories in Saint-Étienne, Charleville and Maubeuge. Even if the method was proved to be good and the will of the king was strong, the first results were quite disappointing. In 1786, Blanc traveled around all the three armories to check whether his method was applied or not, and he found out that it was rejected completely. There are multiple reasons why this was not successful, and one of them is the lack of interest of the gun trading companies. In the old system, they were the key players, but this was not true for the new system. The old system was much more profitable for them. Second, the new method of production created a large number, a huge portion of rejected parts, which is a complete loss for the producers. Third, the templates and the dies that secured interchangeability, they wore out, which means that they had to be replaced quite often and that increased the costs also. 
After returning from this trip, he suggested the king to establish a sample factory at the castle of Vinson to produce interchangeable locks, but also to produce the tooling, which means that the tires, templates and gauges, and also the specialized tools that were necessary for making all parts interchangeable. The king supported this idea, so this factory was established and they started the production. But as the politics were changing, so decreased his support. So, up around 1790, his factory was close to closure, so he approached the government to regain that support. So upon the request of the government, the French National Academy of Sciences established a three-man commission that visited the factory at Vinson, and what they saw was fully satisfying. So they were very happy about what they saw there. In 1791, they wrote a report for the government about the production method, and they stated that this is the best that we can have. They were very, very happy with what Blanc did at Vinson. The report stated the following. We conclude in consequence that the means of execution employed by Monsieur Blanc for the manufacture of firearms of the sort that have their locks all formed of parts which are exactly like all others of their kind, and therefore calculated to be substituted one for another, are very well designed and thought out, and their results are confirmed by experience. And that is very desirable that we make all our arms by these means, which in short deserve the praise and approval of the Academy. The model 1786 light cavalry musketon is a really seductive arm. It is elegant and light, although the stock is a bit short for today's men's size. These are my first tests with the reproduction of the original charge shooting 15.9mm lead round ball. The distance is 25 meters. And that is 25 meters from the rest, and it's still not the practical accuracy. And I already have, let's say, a group size that is a bit bigger than a human head at 25 meters, which is, uh, which tells a lot why the tactical distance for a carbine like this was really not more than 30 paces. One, two, three shots are, let's say, in quite a good group, let's say, in the size of a head, but I have a flyer here. I also felt that this shot was good, so this is, this is the charge and the, and the gun. Let's try it at 50. Louis Antoine Duportel, Secretary of War, was skeptic. So he established his own committee to re examine the situation. And this committee agreed that the method is working, but it also stated that it is much slower and much costly than the old method of manufacturing. So the Secretary of War decided to abandon the interchangeable concept and to revert to the old method. And if you check the dates, then you can see that we are still at 1791, which means that the First Coalition War did not break out, which means that the concept of interchangeability was abandoned before the war. This is important to say because we usually say that uh, the idea was, was, uh, was abandoned because of the large need of firearms in the first years of the war, the First Coalition War. But this is not true. In fact, the government decided to terminate the project before the war. Well, Blanc was quite disappointed. He remained in Saint-Étienne up until 1797, but then he established his own factory for manufacturing of interchangeable locks in Rouen, very close to Saint-Étienne, by the way, and he started manufacturing locks and tooling there. And he was supplying to the state-owned arsenals, so this company was quite successful, although it was always close to bankruptcy. He also reached his final goal here because he was able to manufacture completely interchangeable muskets. He was always balancing at the edge of bankruptcy, so just before his death in 1801, he sold his venture, and it was relocated, partly it was relocated to Liège, where it continued production of musket parts, locks and stuff like that, but with abandoning the concept of interchangeability. It is a good question why this idea was abandoned so fast. Well, it is true that the lack of interest of the gun trading companies and also the high rate of rejected parts, they did not help the system. So it gave very good support to the enemies of the, of the Gribovali systems. But the production method was not perfect either. There were quality issues with the stamping process that made the metal brittle. But also the 
templates and the dyes they wore out and they had to be replaced, that increased the costs. Blanc's facilities in Rouen and in Liège were closed in 1806 and 1807, but the idea was not forgotten. In 1810, the Arsenal and Saint-Étienne and Vincent, they started to experiment with the interchangeable concept again. But that's a different story. So this is the end of the second part, ladies and gentlemen. In the next final part, we are going to talk about the history and the effectiveness of this small little beautiful carbine. So ladies and gentlemen, please like, share, comment, subscribe, switch on notifications. Please support us on Patreon and please visit us on History of Weapons and War platform. Up until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.